Today, we're going to talk about striking the balance between people and performance. It's going to be highly interactive. We're going to be looking to you for chat. We're going to gather some a question that we can take on live. But before we do that, we're going to jump right into this first question. But Liz, do you, have, do you want to talk a little bit about this uh, topic before we get into the first question, or should we bring up the first question now? Well, we're going to talk about this shift. I'll grab this, and we'll just keep passing this like a conch yes. back and forth. Um, we're going to talk about this tension between people and performance. And is it a tension? Like, we are seeing this happen out in the business community. As so many companies have said, we have been really focused on people and well-being and culture and belonging and all of these really good things. And then they're finding as um, maybe it's the macroeconomic environment, um, you know, some companies are missing their numbers. Like there's this swing over to the performance side of things. And I think it's easy for all of us to look at this as the swing, like this pendulum is swinging back and forth. And I think it's dangerous mm -hmm. because when we make these wild swings, we end up like with whiplash and over correcting. It's like and me and my tennis forehand. <laughs> I take these wild big cuts at the ball and then I'm off balance and yeah. Yeah. And so I, I find that it's helpful for me to think about this more as like maybe an, like a, an, like the market needs to correct. Like we have overcorrected maybe to one degree. There's a term we hear a lot. It's kind of corporate jargon and lingo is over rotating. Oh, we've over rotated on this. But I actually think here it's a helpful metaphor to think like, how do we correct where we've made a little bit of an over rotation? And rather than a wild correction in our grip that affects our game, how do we make small changes that bring people focus and performance focus into harmony? Mm -hmm. Here's some of the questions that we want. And, and these are questions we would love to have you light up chat with. And the questions that I want us to think is like, are these two um, factors, people focus and performance focus, are they intention? Or can you actually achieve a level of harmony between the two? And, and maybe the question I most want people to chat in on our insights, could you as a leader, as an organization, as a team, can you be 100% people focused and 100% performance focused? Is it more like a two by two? Can you be really high and fully um, committed to both. We're gonna talk a little bit about what our research teaches us, some of the things we've learned from impact players, a few of things we've learned from multipliers. Like, is there a tension between these two or can we create harmony? And we're gonna talk a little bit about what psychology teaches us about how do you close gaps um, between expectation and, yeah, and performance. Yeah, that's a good place to start. So, I mean, if you think about this, what we're really trying to figure out is, as we look at this balance between people and performance, is where's the potential and how do we close the gap through these small configurations and calibrations? So let's look at the first question. Let's bring that up. Um, and, and so, so thank you for um, um, for one of your colleagues who submitted this question. I'll read it out here. Um, how do you coach an employee who is a great human, you know, has potential to do great things? with the company long-term, but just isn't showing up and giving 100%. I love this question. And this is really looking at this gap between um, not performance and, and people, but really reality and someone's potential. And, you know, it makes me think of something I have said hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times is like the multiplier mindset is this belief that, you know what, people are smart and are capable of solving hard problems and that they want to contribute at their 100%. And you know, if I've learned anything studying leaders um, and contributors at work, it's that people show up wanting to contribute at their fullest, which I absolutely believe is true, but it doesn't mean it's always the case. There's a lot of times where people are performing under their potential and under their capability and really under what they want. Um, and so I think this is, a really interesting one, what do you do as a leader when there is a gap between how people are currently performing and what you know is their potential? Now, it made me think of something that I heard Mark Parker say. So this is Mark Parker, who I think is now the former CEO of Nike. Mm. I know he's like the chairperson of, of Disney, um, a really amazing leader. And he said, um, 
that as the leader of Nike, he was more concerned about the distance between where Nike was and Nike's potential mm -hmm. versus the distance between Nike and their competitors, mm -hmm. which is a more of a performance mm -hmm. focused. And I always thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and it also made me think of a very beloved mentor of mine, um, Carrie Patterson. And if you have read Carrie Patterson, if you are a Carrie Patterson fan, like shout this out on chat. Like what was your favorite thing you learned from Carrie Patterson? This is Carrie Patterson who was the lead author of Crucial Conversations, yeah. Crucial Confrontations, Change Anything and Influence mm. perhaps. And if, you know, actually if there is people who love Carrie Patterson, I wouldn't mind if you went out on the internet and grabbed a picture of him, drop that into chat. Um, but, so I worked for Kerry and learned so many things from him. He was uh, the professor whose class I took that made me fall in love mm. with this whole field. Um, and I remember him once teaching, and he talked about training killer whales. Mm. Now, Sean, do you know anything about training killer whales? No. Yeah, no, um, I don't know a whole lot, too. I'm going to hand that to you. And see, And what he said is, you know, if you are training killer whales, you, you do not wait for the day you know, of course, these killer whales can, you know, leap out of the water, jump up. And we've all seen it. Like, they jump up and they, like, tap and rain this bell whip. He says, you don't wait for them to, like, make this huge leap and ring the bell. Like, you focus on really small increments mm -hmm. and reinforce along the way. So I went out into our um, workshop today and grabbed this. Um, and, and what he, I remember him drawing this line. It's like, you don't hang the bell like up here beyond the reach of the whale and wait, you know, for it to ring the bell. Like you just lower the bar and when the whale can hit, you know, this, you celebrate and you reinforce. And and the way that you try to kill a whale is in small, small increments. Mm -hmm. And when Carrie drew this all out, I just, it stuck with me. I have no idea if it's true. Mm. I do not know if this is how you indeed train killer whales. But for me, it created this metaphor of small gaps, mm -hmm. small successes. And it's so easy as a leader, um, when, when you see someone who's performing and contributing under their potential, to want to just like rouse them up and motivate them and like, you can do this. I know you can. And I think it's so much more healthy to look in small yeah. little steps. Yeah. But that, that makes me think oh, of here, so, here. so, so well, I, we'll leave that with so, you. So I love this idea of the small little steps and getting that calibration right. And it makes me think of, I can, there's so many times in my career I've thought, ooh, I know that I could get much more from this individual. I believe they're smart. They're incredible contributors. And this, this is where this concept of the accidental diminisher may be, it might not be the first place that we go to, but to ask yourself the question, is there anything that I'm doing maybe even un unintentionally, that is causing for, you know, this person to not reach up to the potential that you see. Like, for example, I have a tendency to be a little bit of a rescuer, and I do it because I hate missing milestones. So big goal, want people to, you know, uh, to raise, rise to the occasion. But if, but if I think that someone's going to miss a milestone, and even maybe even before the milestones miss, I have a tendency to kind of rush in take control, make sure that things are on track. Well, over time, that just means that people start to, well, they know that at some point, John's going to come swooping in here, taking control. And so the interesting thing about this is, as I've thought about this, for me as a leader, sometimes I wonder if the reasons why I'm not getting 100% from the people that I'm leading is I don't realize it, but I'm saying to them, take your foot off the gas pedal. You know, don't quite go to a hundred percent. You're filling in the gap between their contribution and their potential. Right. And, you know, I love that you brought this up, Sean. And it reminds me of something I heard um, this last week. I was doing a webinar for um, the good folks at uh, Eli Lilly. And someone said, you know, the reason why I love your work and I love the work of the Wiseman Group is you always start by looking your, at yourself mm -hmm. as a leader. Like, what am I doing to contribute to this problem. And it's a great place to start. Um, like how might I be accidentally diminishing someone to contribute below their capability? And, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about that, writing about that. I want to also share a couple, another Carryism. So another thing I learned from Carrie Patterson, and I was just a young intern and I remember um, working for Carrie and one of his 
frameworks was when you have a performance problem, you need to step back and diagnose it. And is it a motivation problem or is it an ability problem? Mm. Now, I would add to this, is it a leadership problem? Mm. Meaning, are you perhaps having a diminishing effect or is it a knowledge problem? Maybe someone doesn't know. I can't tell you how many people have said, I had no idea I was missing the mark. I had no idea I was contributing below my capability. And we've talked about that in our last sessions. How do you give feedback? And someone said, yes, I saw it on chat. Yes, you can be 100% people focused, 100% performance focused, but it requires radical honesty mm -hmm. and radical candor. And we've talked about this idea of the thermostat and giving people information about like, you know, too warm, too cold. We've talked about director notes, like just making a habit of like saying, you know, here, here's a little tweak mm -hmm. on your performance there that would help you kind of hit that mark. But I want to talk about like, what if it's a, what if it's a motivation problem? Mm -hmm. And what if it's an ability problem? Mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll start with ability because I noticed, I think it was, Stephen here in chat made a reference to uh, Shankar, I have you take a look at that. He made a reference to Adam Grant's new book. Mm. And I think this is a fabulous um, read. Uh, I'm a big fan of Adam Grant and Grant's also a big fan of our work um, with, with multipliers. And, you know, this book on hidden potential, the science of achieving greater things, it really breaks down what people can do to develop their potential and to live up to their potential and to develop talents. And it's not a given, it's a, there's a science behind this. And one of the things, one of the gems in this book, and it's a great book because there's sort of a, a diamond here on top, is that there are certain traits that people who tend to develop potential have like, um, they tend to be imperfectionists. Mm -hmm. They tend to um, enjoy discomfort. And they, let me see, what was the other one? Um, they tend to be sponges. Yeah. But if you don't naturally come by that, there are things you can do. And he talks about scaffolding and, you know, like creating deliberate play and taking side steps. And I think that, that scaffolding is a great metaphor for leaders, meaning if you've got someone who's, contributing below their potential, how do you create scaffolding that would help them take these incremental mm -hmm. steps? So I want to pause here, mm -hmm. Sean, and I want to just put this out to chat. Like if you've got someone mm -hmm. delivering below potential, what is scaffolding that you could put in place to help them achieve a series of small wins? Mm -hmm. so let's see what's said here. Okay, I'm just going to grab my reading glasses to make sure that I can read it right okay so stretch assignments uh julie thanks for just kicking us off there um consistent check-ins from andrea make it safe to fail and let's see if we can even tease out a theme as we let some of these roll uh another so this is fun trish says incremental self-reflections benchmark goals from heather you know there's definitely a theme already and just in like the concept of tweaking things like that the support it's not necessarily about like you know a huge stretch challenge or you know making some kind of a big adjustment but it's these little teeny things that people are needing yeah this is small uh, being small iterations encouraging curiosity risk taking small iterations again i, I want to go back to this like make it safe to fail i find that that's a really helpful scaffolding um one of the things I've tried to do more and more is that anytime we do something new, I like to let people know, you know what, we are going to get this wrong at least three times mm -hmm. before we get it right. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you get some things wrong still, like today we can get the audio working. It's been working for us and we get things wrong. But when you say you know, like, there are going to be three wrongs before we get something right, it just creates the safety for, you know what, we don't have to close this this gap at once like we're going to iterate yeah and there. most likely you can't close the gap at once anyway so then all of a sudden we're working with reality kind of we're back to this idea of really obeying the law of the harvest we people can't make these big huge jumps no and it reminds me and i have to admit there's something i'm a little bit bitter about my son joshua now i'm not bitter entirely about joshua but joshua i don't know have we talked about this how sean i have no hops 
No. No, I have. We haven't talked. You, you're ground stricken. I'm ground stricken. I'm like a ground dweller. <laughs> like I mean, I don't know. Like what's my my vertical leap? You know, it's like it's there like it an, it's like an inch. I mean, I just got. You no got two. Off. We'll give you two. That might have been one in heels. Like it's two and a half without heels on, and my son Joshua teases me mercilessly about the fact that I have no hops. And he's always like, mom, you should be able to hop up on that bench. And he shows me that he can hop up on the bench. And I'm like, I can't do that. And actually I've got this huge like lump on my leg from when three years ago, I tried to do one of these big hops with him. And I, <laughs> like, I, you know, like concrete and I had this big wealth that hasn't gone away. It's like three years later. And what is so much more helpful is when he finally figured out like, his mom cannot, does not have a 36 inch vertical leap. Um, and he'd be like, okay, mom, I get that you can't do that, but you could probably, you could probably jump an inch higher. Mm -hmm. And then we would create these little things. I'm like, yeah, I could jump an inch higher. Mm -hmm. And I worked on it and it was so much more motivating and it felt within reach when he acknowledged that, like, I did not have the potential mm -hmm. for an MBA, you know, mm -hmm. uh, player but I could get a little bit better mm -hmm. and so it became accessible yeah um okay what else are we saying there in terms of like how do you create scaffolding for people to close the gap between where they currently are and their yeah potential? um let's see here uh oh do we have There's a video so for great week? stuff going here just making sure that we don't have a bubble assignment uh Don says Okay, I don't know what a bubble assignment what is. What is a bubble assignment, Don? Just put us in a little bit more. 10% 10, 10 better. Um, what does that look like for the individual? That's that's an interesting idea I love from Pam. 10% better. And I also love what Chris Fry, who was at um, Salesforce at the time, when he said, you know, he wanted to have his team become multipliers. He said, you know, I just want my whole team to get 1% better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it puts us on this path of incremental progress. It starts to build a success cycle. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely talk about the uh, like um, clarity of the vision. People really know what it is that um, um, that 10% looks like. Uh, ask the person to talk through thinking, uh, thinking through the process and asking questions. Kathy says, micro learning sessions, small scalable activities that build on habits first. Right. There's another there's another thing that I'm I'm wondering about. So this idea of scaffolding definitely directionally feels right to close the gap. Um, there's almost sometimes a silent, there's like a sleeper in this that I've observed. Remember when we did that, when we were first doing impact players and we asked the question to, to loads of contributors, just what was holding them back from doing their very best work. And we got, there was a response that came back. One of them that really caught my eye, eye which was that people found themselves overloaded and switching between so many things. They're being pulled in so many different directions. And so sometimes this can be a momentum problem. We, we have this friend, um, his name's Jim Perry. He's this brilliant um, thinker. At, he he was with this uh, partner of ours, BTS. He's on um, he's on uh, he's off making you know like a really cool AI learning business right now. Um, but he he mentioned something to me. He said that a lot of times what's happening inside of people is that they know they want to have a big impact, but they're just looking at their to do list and how fast that's changing, what's on it, and they just feel disheartened. So he said, you think that you're not getting 100% of their effort. You are getting 100% of your effort, but their effort, but it's just, it's spread it's out. Dissipating. It's dissipating. And so he just pointed out to me that sometimes this can be a momentum problem. Well, what, what, what they might be needing from us is to tune in and to figure out like, where is their 100% going? What does that pie chart look like? Because if that pie chart, you know, looks so evenly distrib distributed with a hundred things on it. Now, all of a sudden, we, it doesn't seem like they're actually doing anything big at all that you believe that they can do. And so there's this, and I think that there was a Gallup poll recently that said in today's labor market, people are, are taking on, they think 58% more than what they normally would be taking on. Oh. And so on the one hand, we do need to step up and to really play big and to solve the problems that aren't being solved. But sometimes that can come to where we're so distributed and it's pretty hard to raise your hand and say that. I mean, I know for me, sometimes it's really hard for me to raise my hand and say, well, actually, like, I think that I'm going like 110, but I'm just doing so many different things. It's not really adding up. And so I'm not reaching my potential in this way. 
Right, and maybe that um, gets us to rounding out this subject. And, you know, Carrie had said, like, when there's a performance problem, you've got to figure out, is it an ability problem and a motivation or a motivation? And this is where we can start to encounter motivation problems. And maybe we'll spend two minutes on this before we move on to this next question. Like, what do you do if people's contribution has dissipated? People can't see it. They're feeling like they're burnt out or bored out as, you know, um, can also be categorized. Or as our friend Adam Grant says, people are languishing. Yeah. And how do you get that kind of reinvigoration? It doesn't usually come from a big motivational speech. In some ways, it, right, that will usually do the opposite. Right. It causes people to pull yeah. back because you're just reminding me that I'm falling yeah. short and I'm falling short of expectations and my own expectations and my potential. But what we might do is think about the opposite, which is like maybe what we need are breaks and more parsing of our works. One of the big problems of the work world is that um, we, we don't have periodic breaks in things. It, it's rare. So, you know, a lot of people go off to college or they come out of high school and they've had this concept of a quarter or a semester where you start a subject, you take tests, you get a grade, you celebrate the end of semester, you go on break, and then you come back and you start fresh. And most of us, work just feels more like you know, a habit trail, a hamster wheel, like mm -hmm. a treadmill where we're going and we don't have these breaks. And this is one where we might think about, okay, if someone's under contributing to their potential, maybe they need um, a new semester. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need a fresh start, mm -hmm. a fresh job. Now that's not always mm -hmm. available, but maybe a fresh project or a fresh leader. Mm -hmm. One of my very favorite colleagues in the whole world, uh, Ben Putterman, uh, he, he worked on my team for 10 years. I was his boss for 10 years. And I remember that I'm like, Ben, I think what you need to really grow as a professional is you need a different boss. And I love Ben and I would work in for him and it broke my heart, but I knew Ben needed to go and develop his potential under a different leader. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it's just uh, like a fresh colleague to do it, but we've got to get our way back into the rookie zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's move on to this next question. Let's go ahead and put it up um, on, and now we're going to kind of flip, flip the lens. So we looked at this first. This first problem was definitely a leadership challenge and, and, and looking at how can we as leaders figure out that puzzle to get the balance between people and performance and to get 100% of people's Effort, which we're really, what we're really saying is we're trying to access their discretional effort. That might be a way to think about this: is that these strategies give us the ability to add, ask, to access people's discretional effort, or to pull things back so they can give discretional effort through these incremental changes. Now let's flip the lens. It's this idea of um, what about from a contributor perspective? What's a question that we could take on where we're striking the balance between these? And here it is. Do we have that up? Let me just make sure that I can. Yep, here it is. Okay, so. Um, thinking about this through the lens of a contributor, how can you effectively embrace leadership roles when your superiors recognize your potential and offer opportunities, yet you find meeting their expectations challenging and face perception of being unprepared? Okay, I love, I love this question because this is the exact opposite. You've got in the previous question, a leader is like, there's a gap between where they're at and where I think they can be. And now we've got the contributor saying, I think there's a gap between where I am and what I think I can do and other people's um, hopes for me and expectations. And I love this scenario because it shows leaders who are seeing potential and capability and they want, they want to help people raise the bar. They want to help people level up in that. So I think it'd be interesting to look at this both from, if you need to close this gap between people's expectations of you and your perceived abilities, there's two ways to close that gap. One is to increase your perceived capabilities of yourself. And then the other is to look at how do you get those expectations within grasp? Mm -hmm. Not too dissimilar to me saying to my son, I can't hop mm -hmm. two feet. Mm -hmm. I can't do that because you're like, mom, you can do this. Like I had to lower that to something that felt within reach for me. So let's take it in these two parts. We're going to phone a nerd on both parts of this. So we have not heard from Lauren just yet. We want to phone a nerd because, you know, 
part of this like gap is like, well, I don't know that I can do this, which just harkens to imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, we would love to hear from you. Tell us a little bit about, I don't know, maybe the state of imposter syndrome. How bad is it? Who's got it? What are people doing about it? I'm going to share a few ideas for what I've done to address imposter syndrome. And Sean, I'd love to hear it from you as well. I think that some of these things about imposter syndrome really can be helpful to keep in mind. Uh, research has shown that over 70% of people in the workforce report feeling imposter syndrome at some point in their professional life. Um, and I can tell you that those numbers are actually a little bit old. I, I would guess that it would be higher now that people are more familiar with this phenomenon. And differing from your peers in any way, in race or gender or sexuality or age or um, your background, where you've come up through the organization can fuel those feelings of fraud. But there's other research that shows that there can actually be real advantages to experiencing imposter syndrome. Um, it can make you more other oriented, uh, more likable, more adept at relationships. Um, there was one study that looked at doctors in training and found that those who had more frequent imposter thoughts um, were better at handling sensitive interactions with patients. Um, another similar study found that job candidates who had more imposter thoughts uh, went into interviews, had not just the interview, but you know the, the pre-interview chat and post-interview talking and everything, and that they asked a lot more questions than those who had fewer imposter thoughts, and that that caused them to be viewed by hiring managers as having better people skills. Lauren, thank you for that. I'm going to interpret from that, like having a little bit of imposter syndrome is positive. Right. And you wouldn't have imposter syndrome if you didn't have some internal and inherent motivation. Yeah. So like, it's good. And um, I, I'll share with you kind of how I've dealt with imposter syndrome over the years. Um, and I want to start with when I landed at Oracle and I felt myself surrounded by, so this was Oracle's hiring profile. They looked for people who were crazy smart and really driven and achievement oriented and nice. Not everyone was nice, but I felt like everyone was so smart. And I remember, and they, they hired from 17 schools, elite That's schools. It. Just 17. 17. Now, there were a few other people who snuck in through the back door, mm -hmm. and I was one of the people who snuck in from the back door. I didn't go to one of those 17 schools. And I remember thinking as in my first weeks as I'm, like, getting to know, like, my class of people that had just graduated from college and started there, I'm like, man, I work with, these are brilliant people. And for, I'm not sure what reason, I just decided that I wasn't going to feel inadequate that I didn't go to one of those schools or maybe didn't feel as smart as them. I just remember feeling so grateful mm -hmm. to work with them. I'm like, man, mm -hmm. I work with amazing you, people. You, you switch the lens from worrying about what you weren't to being like, deeply appreciative of having the opportunity to be in the position. It caused me to be other oriented. And mm -hmm. Lauren mentioned this, that imposter syndrome, because we're focused on these people like, wow, everyone seems amazing. But me, I just left out the but me part yeah. of it. And I'm like, well, I work with amazing people. And then you start to go, well, somebody hired me. Yeah. And so I must be kind of smart mm -hmm. and, you know, achievement oriented as well. And I just felt lucky to be in the room. Mm -hmm rather than I didn't belong in the room. And then I remember being thrown into jobs where I had no idea what I was yeah. doing. And, you know, they're hiring all the top graduates of um, computer science, electrical engineering out of the top. You know, these are out of MIT and, you know, Carnegie Mellon, Caltech and, you know, Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, all these schools. And now I'm thrown into a programmer job. And I've written about this in Impact Players. I'm now teaching programming to a bunch of, smart nerds mm -hmm. from all these elite universities. I'm like, what am I doing here? And I remember telling myself, well, all those super nerds, they learned it at some point. Mm -hmm. Some of them learned it, you know, at MIT. Mm -hmm. Other of them started coding when they were mm -hmm. teenagers. Probably a few of them were protégés and they started doing this, like maybe 
C++ was their first spoken language. I don't know. But like, Unlikely, though. <laughs> like they learned it at some point, yeah. and I'm just now learning it at this point. Yeah. And maybe even that means my learning is fresh. Mm-hmm. And like we all learn things at different points. Those things have really helped me kind of stay out of that imposter syndrome, yeah. which is like, well, I may not know it, but I'm capable of learning it. Yeah. So has there, like, what has helped you, Sean? Yeah, um, you know, there's, okay, I am a super late bloomer. So I'm listexic, dyslexic. <laughs> um, and they, when I was a kid, they put me in the room with the three other kids that were poking each other with their compass. And I knew that that meant something um, about me and about them. And, and so I honestly, I just stopped trying. Like, I mean, the, it was good intended, you know, there was good intentions to be, and I love the people that, you know, had me in the little room with, uh, with those, you know, those few select kids, um, you know, and I just joined in and poked everybody with the compass too, because that's what, you know, for those of you that don't know what a compass was back in the day, we had these little things that you could, had a little spike so you could twirl and make these little beautiful circles. So I kind of, I kind of learned that maybe I wasn't as smart as everybody else. And so I stopped trying. Well, that reinforced later in school that um that that maybe i wasn't smart and i remember we did one of the standardized tests where you know you come in and they figure out where you are and i thought well i'm not very smart they told me it wasn't going to be graded so i thought well if it's not going to be graded then i'm going to just do hangman and draw little pictures of animals with the bubble with the you know the what are those things called the bubble with the little scantrons. the scantrons a couple of weeks later, I got called into the principal's office. My parents were there, and I was like, I'm sure I haven't done anything. I started going through the inventory of all the bad things that would have been above the waterline, and I realized that there was nothing that they, I could be in this troublesome situation. And it was about 10 minutes in, I realized that they were extremely concerned about my intelligence level. And then I realized, and then I thought, well, man, I'm not that bad. Like, I'm pulling C's or something here. You know, this is like seventh grade. And then I realized, oh, it must have been that test that I was doing all of those little animals for. And so now this administration is really worried that like I hardly have a pulse. But this is kind of what happens sometimes when you're not an early bloomer or you kind of, for whatever reason, you take into that job that you're not as capable as those other people. And one of the things that helped me big time in this scenario was, was recognizing that in this world, there are people that are not early bloomers that there are loads of late bloomers. And and so I had to start kind of betting on myself as a late bloomer instead of, you know, wishing that I would have been that young kid that got, you know, got into the science fair even, you know, because my cup of dirt didn't even make the the line, right? And so I think that I think that I think that part of this is just recognizing that we're all on these different trajectories and that there are some people that are just going to grow much later in life. Um there's a second thing that I'll just. There's a second, I, I love that you share the story because it, it's like I know this about you, but it's like I, I'm shocked every time I hear this about you. I was just talking with someone about you just this week, last week, and they're like, "Oh, Sean Vanderhoven has this warmth and this personal personality that belies his like whip smart intelligence," and like. Maybe that was a late bloomer, but like I see you as like, man, one of like the most intelligent people I've ever had this privilege to work with. So I think part of it is like helping yourself see see yourself as like, you know what? I don't know it, but I can learn it. And people are saying beginner's mindset, growth mindset. I think another um, strategy for upping our capability against these gaps is to pull something that we learned from um, impact players and our research. And it was one of the things that we found about the people who are having the biggest impact in the workplace and in their work and these real difference makers is that they looked at scary things through a different lens where other people, um, and, and they saw threatening situations differently, where other people saw a threat and something that was risky, they found opportunity in that. And so we've got here, we've got here <clears throat> our opportunity lens. And <laughs> Sean, they look good on you. And and like I think it's natural and normal for people to first see a threatening, scary situation through this lens of like, 
this is risky, this is a threat to my success, a threat to my concept as a smart, capable person, this is a threat to my productivity, it's a threat to my leadership, it's a threat to my reputation. And, and we find it's natural and normal. Some people never take off those lenses. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and what we find is that the impact players, they, they may first see this through a threat lens, but then they very quickly or eventually put on more of an opportunity lens, which is like, okay, I'm looking at the same thing. This is not delusional optimism. It is not toxic positivity. The threat lens is necessary mm -hmm. and leaders, we have to help people first see things through a threat lens mm -hmm. because if we never let people look at the threat, they have a hard time looking at the opportunity. But we find that the people who have a lot of impact say, okay, now I see this sucky situation. I don't like it, mm -hmm. but how is this an opportunity to um, add value? How is this an opportunity to be useful? How is this an opportunity to serve? How is this an opportunity to demonstrate leadership? Mm -hmm. How is this an opportunity for us to do things differently, to yeah. learn, to show our flexibility when the audio doesn't work. Like, yeah, it sucks. And those 10 minutes suck for everyone, but it was an opportunity for us to like exercise some flexibility mm -hmm. muscles. Well, you said something that I, I find really interesting and that is it's, it's actually fairly valuable to have both lenses. It, it, and if you're, if you're prone to see things through kind of like contingency strategies and liabilities, well, then you can start there. You can write down all of the risks that you see in a situation, but then you can stretch a bit to then say, but I'm going to, I'm going to create a second column of where the, what are the opportunities that lie here? So then you can even take an educated and a balanced approach rather, but, but just not being, you know, frightened off or at least kind of diminished by this perception that you just can't do it because it's going to be too hard. Right. And it's not like this is a better lens. It's that these lenses can exist in harmony. Right. And I think it's really healthy on a team where a leader talks about what could go wrong. And, and that is going to reduce that gap for mm. people on the team. Okay. So we've talked about what we can do to kind of up our perception of our own ability, like, okay, I can handle that. I see value creation there. Let's talk about the other thing, which is how do we help <clears throat> reduce the expectations? So you're like, yeah, I can jump that high. Mm -hmm. And for this, I want us to start our conversation by going to our favorite dirt and um, to ask Lauren to talk to us a little bit about risk taking versus risk mitigation and really do you have to be a big risk taker to be able to close these gaps between what people hope for you and what you really feel like you're able to jump mm -hmm. okay lauren to you thanks liz you know a lot of this risk mitigation strategy um actually like fits really well with what you were just saying about an opportunity lens and a threat lens because so much of uh, I mean, there's a whole branch of decision theory in economics that deals with like, why are some people, rational people, intelligent people willing to take certain risks while others aren't? And there's, there's kind of a common sense that someone like an entrepreneur, someone who is starting their own business, someone who's making a really big, big move somewhere must be a just like inherently more risk, um, risk comfortable person, like a risk prone person, but that might be a misconception. And actually a lot of experts theorize that entrepreneurs aren't really inherently more comfortable with risk. They just see it differently. They look at it differently, define it differently and manage it differently. And I'm going to go super quickly through, through a couple of ways that, that they do that. One is that um, they look at the downside with like a lot of richness and clarity. They're not just optimistic and saying, like, I think everything will be great. They're, they're really clear about what is the opportunity cost here? And what's, what's, what's the risk of not doing this in tangible and intangible things? Like maybe there's, what's the risk of losing my salary, but also what's the risk of not satisfying my curiosity? What is the risk of not doing this thing I really believe in? Um, we find that people kind of across the board are, are loss averse, meaning that humans are more willing to, uh, to take a risk 
I guess if you have two gambles in front of you and one is maybe you will win something um, and the other is maybe you uh, like maybe you'll lose but maybe you won't lose we really we're willing to take a risk if it means maybe we don't lose um, where we we're more likely to take like a certain payout if it's a gain um, so seeing that loss really clearly can make them more likely to to jump in and take a risk um, additionally embarrassment plays a role where we tend to be less less risky when we're in the limelight um, if we feel like we have a lot of eyes on us so some amount of it is like being willing um, being willing to fail in front of other people being willing to be open about our shortcomings additionally um, there's the fact that the more times you flip a coin the more certain it is that your overall payoff approaches the expected payoff um, so the more reps you have with taking risks, looking at risky things, looking at it through an opportunity lens, the best. Okay, risk mitigation strategies. How do you how do you lower expectations? One is you channel some inner imperfectionist. And you know, Adam Grant talks about this in the book, you know, hidden potential. But it's about figuring out what has to be done really well and what can be done just good enough. Mm -hmm. Um, this is something good leaders do for people. They separate what I call the freeways from the playground. So they're like, you know what? In the work we do, there are some things that have to be done just exactly right. Little mistakes can be very costly. These are the freeways. We have to get it exactly right. Versus this other, other part of the work, um, these are playgrounds. We can take risks. We can make mistakes. We can fail. And we can recover from that. If your leader doesn't do this for you, you can do it for yourself. Like, okay, what are the things that I have to nail and get exactly right? And what are the things that it needs to be, you know, good enough and solid? This like frees you up from feeling like everything has to be done to this incredible um, level. I think um, borrowing one of the ideas from impact players, coming up with a statement of work mm -hmm. is helpful. Like if someone doesn't clarify what success looks like, you can get that down to the ground level, mm -hmm. which is like, okay, before I take this on, so like, Sean, if you give me a piece of work, what I would say to you is, okay, Sean, help me, like, let's see if we can come up with this common view of success. I want to know what success looks like. Tell me what a great job looks like. Mm -hmm. How will I know, like, I've done a brilliant job at this. And likely what you tell me is going to be lower than what I'm fearing a great job mm -hmm. looks like. What does done look like? How will I know I've completed this like to your expectations and what is out of bounds what you know is out of the question what do i not need to worry about and all of this takes this amorphous mm -hmm. expectation of brilliance and takes it down to oh that's not that's not so mm -hmm. it's not so difficult it's like that children's book the monster that grew small like as yeah. this kid climbed up this mountain to the cave like this monster turned out to be just a little lizard like, oh, I can do that. Yeah. Um, another strategy is to kind of activate people's mentoring gene by asking for guidance mm -hmm. along the way. So you're constantly calibrating. And Sean, you do this maybe better than anyone I know. So like, what does it look like so that you're constantly getting intel to know if you're getting it right? Well, one of the challenges with feedback is that you kind of feel like that you're going to the judgment bar a little bit. You know, if I give you a piece of work and say, hey, Liz, will you give me some feedback on this? Oh, that's, that's a nervy business. I, um, for anybody who's been around football, I liken that to the first, you know, like in the summer you work out without pads and then you have your first practice with pads where you're, you know, you're colliding with each other. Okay. And the way that you feel before your first practice with pads is pretty nervous. And that's what feedback can be like Oftentimes when we go to get feedback, we kind of feel nervous to get it. So you can kind of switch this a little bit to instead go ask for advice. If you can ask somebody for guidance, hey, how can you guide me through accomplishing this goal? Then now all of a sudden you activate this advice, this advice gene inside of them, which brings us together as a unit. Now we're a team. You're advising me so we can win together. And so when I'm giving this kind of guidance, I'm now like really invested. Yeah, and in so, so instead of judging me or, or telling me on whether I've done something that's good or bad, now you're kind of thinking about, oh, 
well, we could do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you're probably even pulling in a little bit to some resource maybe that you have to be able to help the situation or definitely at least thinking about what the path might look like so I can succeed rather than just getting the stamp of, you know, a grade or something like this. And so I find that asking for guidance, which gives me kind of a future push, like it's like cutting the path, if you will, I feel half as anxious because I'm I'm not worried that I'm going to be sized up, but rather I feel like that I'm going to, you know, kind of start an adventure with my boss. And I would add to this, it's like acknowledging that there is this gap. And we talked about like activating a mentoring gene. And I'm thinking back to a coaching assignment I had at Apple where there was a really, really capable executive who had some bench strength issues. Like the organization needed him to step into a really big job, but the people under him were not as capable and were not perceived by others as capable. So nobody wanted the B team to come into the meeting. Everyone wanted the executive. They wanted the A player. And he was having this trouble because he couldn't grow into this other role because no one was willing to tolerate his underlings stepping in for him. And he's like, they're just going to get beaten up in the ring. And so we devised this little plan and, um, what it was is that he went around to all the other executives where he needed to send the B team in. And he said, you know what? They're, like, they're not me and they're going to be struggling, but I'm trying to develop them and develop their capability. So like, I just wanted to, you to know that I'm like working on developing them. That's why I'm sending them rather than myself. And I remember meeting with him after he went out and did this and he had this huge smile on his face. I'm like, how did it go? And he goes, well, not only did they not beat them up, they took these people under their wing. Yeah. And so these executives he thought was going to rip them apart. They were like, Hey, you know what? Like, yeah, what do you think? And what do you want to add to this? And it activated this mentoring gene because people want to close gaps. I think Maybe it's one of the, the overarching principles here is we don't like gaps. Yeah. We don't like them when we feel a gap between our capability and potential. We don't like it when people in our team, and we're also motivated to close it. So if you acknowledge the gap and you let people know you're learning and you project not clueless learner, but intelligent learner, mm -hmm. like I, I, I'm working on this, this is what I'm doing, it activates this mentoring gene, people give you guidance, they're um, vested in your success, and it helps you close it. Okay, we are kind of getting towards time. We're out of time. Um, I want to see what people all say on chat. Like, how do you close the gap between people's expectation of you and what you believe you can successfully deliver? Put that in chat. We'll just take a moment while you put your thinking in there on. How do you deal with these gaps as a leader? What are the best strategies that you found to deal with the gap as a contributor? Thanks for putting this in while you're um, putting these thoughts in, recognizing that we're at time. Let me real quick announce what we're going to be doing next month. We've all been in these situations where you've had as a leader something thrust upon you. Maybe you pick up a team member that you weren't um, anticipating, and maybe they don't want to work with you either. Or maybe you're in a situation where you've been asked to do something that isn't something that you particularly want to do. Or as a contributor, you're put on a team that you're um, that you 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 weren't asking for or looking for. We all have these situations where things occur. We feel like things are thrust upon us, and they're, we're a little bit out of control. Next time for Leadership Matters, we're going to take on these questions: How do you deal with these situations where you feel out of control? Um, uh, and maybe you are slightly. Uh, to be able to still contribute at your very best or to lead in a way where you get people's very best thinking. That's a wrap for us. Liz, do you have anything that you want to say before well, we, we I go? I love the way Heather um, short and how Heather said, you know, celebrate small wins, then co-design the next step. Jessica said curiosity plus candor plus co-creation. Um, it creates meaningful progress. You know, again, do not wait till like the whale jumps up and, and hits the target. It's like, celebrate each one of the small wins, break it down into pieces, let people know there are gaps, mind the gaps. Thanks, Liz. Okay, till next time, we're excited to see you in a month. We'll send some communication out to connect. In the meantime, have a fantastic rest of your Tuesday. And thanks for hanging in with us with you know a good 10 minutes of audio problems. It keeps us humble. We're gonna um, see what we can do to fix that next time.
Thank you.